right, Revelation chapter number two tonight. As you find that uh, in your Bible, if you would go ahead and stand. Uh, we're going to be reading a little bit of a longer text. We're looking at the letter to the church in Thyatira, the church in Thyatira. And uh, the text is from verse 18 down through the close of the chapter in verse number 29. And so the church in Thyatira, verse 18 in Revelation chapter 2, uh, Jesus sends this letter and says, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received with my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Well, let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the word of God uh, this evening. And Lord, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather together here and to study your word together. We pray now that you would speak to our hearts through the preaching of your word and by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Help us and equip us that we might be able to serve you more and to serve you better. Help us to learn from your word tonight. And Lord, we pray as always that souls can be saved and lives changed and that revival would come. And we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we do humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. Uh, let me mention to you a little bit of background about this church in Thyatira. The truth of the matter is there's not much known. Uh, not much known about the ancient city of Thyatira or the church there. Now, we do know from some historical things that it was a, uh, a type of a military outpost. It's located about 40 miles east of the city of Pergamos. And its main purpose was like as a garrison or as a guard uh, for that city of Pergamos, which was the capital of that region uh, in Asia in that time. And, and Thyatira was a commercial city. It had many roads bringing trade from practically half of the, of the world around there. Uh, it was recognized as a center for the wool and cloth dyeing industry. Uh, it was known especially for producing a very expensive purple dye. And we've got a reference to this in the book of Acts. If you want to look there with me in Acts chapter 16, verse 13 and verse number 14. Now this is a time in, in the book of Acts. Let me back up a little bit and, and read for you how that, well, I'll just mention to you that in the background of this, Paul and, uh, and those that, that were with him were going uh, on their missionary journey and uh, they were going to go on uh, into Asia, but instead Paul has a vision and, and, and God closes the door to go into Asia and, and sends them on into, into Europe. And, uh, and so in verse 9, a vision uh, of, of Acts 16, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and, and help us. And so they went immediately to Macedonia. Uh, which would be Europe, and it was in uh, Philippi uh, in Macedonia, and verse 13, verse 14 of Acts 16 says, and on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, 
and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, and notice a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which are spoken of Paul. And so here's the mention of this one named Lydia, and, and Lydia is kind of significant because she would be considered the very first convert in Europe, the very first convert on European uh, soil there in Macedonia. But she came from uh, Thyatira, and so she was a seller of purple. Well, that was that's what was known about the city of Thyatira, that it was a city known for this uh, uh, industry of, of, the, of the purple dye, of dyeing cloth. And so, so it was something that she brought evidently from, uh, from there to, uh, uh, to Philippi, uh, or to, to Philippi there in Macedonia. And so it's just an interesting kind of side note about this place where this church is at that Jesus is sending this letter to, to the church in Thyatira. And, and you notice that it's the longest of all the seven letters. Uh, but the, like, like most of them, there are given a few words of commendation, and, but followed by some severe words of complaint. And Jesus does that here in this letter to this church. I remind you that the first one, the church in Ephesus, uh, we could refer to as the passionless church. That's the church that had left their first love, left their love for Jesus, left their love for revival. And then there was Smyrna, which was a persecuted church, and that was a church where Jesus had no uh, complaint about, had no condemnations for. He gave them just encouraging words. And then Pergamos was the patronizing church, a, a, a compromising church with the world around them. Thyatira, uh, Thyatira would be thought of as a permissive church, a permissive church. They allowed this one that Jesus calls Jezebel to bring great sin and idolatry and immorality into the church. Uh, they lacked proper biblical standards uh, within the leadership of the church itself. There's a prophetical understanding of it. Prophetically, Thyatira is a picture of the apostate church. And, and, and folks, that's what we're seeing today. Amen. We're seeing these days of apostasy just prior to the second coming of Jesus, which the Bible tells us that it's going to be that way. And so this is a picture of the apostate church, a church that has gone after the world, a church that has allowed immorality uh, to, uh, to be in it. And, uh, and then following uh, Pergamos and the establishment of the corrupt Roman system of religion that we refer to today as Roman Catholicism, Thyatira pictures the church in, in full-blown human, humanism and apostasy, much like what uh, is going on uh, today. But Jesus points out here there's still a remnant. There's still a remnant. Notice verse 24. But unto you I say and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of, of, of Satan. He says, I'll put uh, upon you none other burden. Uh, but that which you already have, he says, hold fast to it till I come. Verse 26, he that overcometh keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power uh, over the nations. And so he's got some good words uh, for them there. And, and so there is a remnant, even in the midst of a church that is representing apostate times prophetically, a church that had allowed uh, much wickedness to come into the church itself. And so notice what really the Lord Jesus gives to the uh, what we call the remnant of believers. In verse number 18, there actually is a very wonderful picture or portrait of the Savior, a wonderful portrait of the Savior. He said, And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brands. This is a picture of, of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's really quite wonderful to see. And there's a couple of uh, very special things that, that can we can uh, apply from this. First of all, you'll notice how that he announces his deity because he introduces himself to this church as the Son of God. 
He just says it right, right plain. He said, this is where, this is who sending you this letter. Uh, this is, he said, uh, these things saith the Son of God. And so right from the start at this letter, uh, when, when the people uh, of the church in Thyatira would have received it, right from the beginning they could understand that they were not dealing with a prophet like Isaiah or with a preacher uh, like the Apostle Paul, but instead the recipients of this letter were dealing with deity. Jesus said that what, this letter is coming from the Son of God. The very Son of God Himself. A message directly from the divine Son of God. I mean, just think of that. Suppose you were to receive a letter uh, in the mail and, and, and with a return address label that said that it was from heaven. And you open that letter up and it was signed by the nail-scarred hand of the very Son of God. That's really something like uh, what these people have gotten here at this church in Thyatira. We would think, well, what a, what a wonderful thing that would be. But the truth of the matter is, folks, we have such a letter already. Amen. We have such a letter as the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is that letter. I'm holding it in my hand. And I'm talking from Genesis to Revelation all the way through. This book has come from God, you see. This is the Word of God itself. Uh, this is a, a letter to us from the very Son of God. And, uh, and this book, by the way, announces the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is God in the flesh, uh, that He did come to this earth and die on the old rugged cross, paid the penalty for my sins and for your sins, and He is coming back. And then, on top of all that, He actually is God. Amen. It describes and declares His deity. And then, it describes His ability or he describes his ability here in the letter. Uh, notice how he said, it shows us two things here in verse 18. First of all, his ability to see, where he said that these things saith the Son of God, notice, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire. He has eyes like a flame of fire. This tells us that he has intimate knowledge of all things. That as the Son of God, he is omniscient. Uh, he knows everything about us. His eyes penetrate into the innermost uh, beings of our, of, our, of our heart and of our soul. Uh, nothing is hid from him. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 13, the Bible says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him uh, with whom we have to do. That's the Son of God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He has ability to see. He has eyes like unto a flame of fire. But then he also has ability to judge. Because it says here in his uh, portrait of himself in verse 18, These things said the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. He has the ability to judge as well as the ability to see. Because here we see a symbol of judgment. Uh, brass uh, is a metal that is used in Scripture as a symbol of judgment. Uh, sin must be judged. And God will not remain silent or inactive uh, concerning the matter of man's sin. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness uh, of men. And the thing about it is, when we think about this, we, we don't like to think about Jesus Christ here with feet of brass. We'd rather be thinking about uh, him as Isaiah would describe back in Isaiah 52 and verse 7. Where in Isaiah he says, How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish, publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publish, publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. That's the way we want to uh, see Jesus and to see his feet. But understand this, Jesus came the first time with the beautiful feet of salvation. Amen. That's what he came to seek and to save that which was lost. 
He came declaring the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God. He came the first time to the earth with beautiful feet of salvation, but he is coming a second time to the earth with brass feet of judgment. That's how he's being depicted here. He is, uh, this is his picture. He has, he, his deity is the son of God. And then his ability, he can see, nothing is hid from him. His ability, he is the judge and he will judge the sins of, of this world. And so it's a wonderful portrait or a picture of the Savior. But then if you'll notice in verse number 19, he gives a word of praise for the saints. A word of praise for the saints. Now remember, what we're looking at here and thinking about the church in Thyatira, they were the permissive church. And we're going to look into that uh, part of this letter a little bit deeper in our next uh, uh, message on Sunday evening uh, coming up this week. But for now, these are some words of, of commendation, encouragement, and so forth uh, for the saints, for the remnant. Uh, much wickedness has been allowed in the church, but there were some that still held the standards and still lived their lives in holiness and still desired to please uh, the Lord. It might have been only a very small minority of the people, but they were there, and Jesus has these words for them as, as we saw there and read in verse number 24. And so notice his word of praise for the saints in verse number 19 where he says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notice uh, a couple of things that he says that he knows here. First of all, he, he knows the manifestation of their works. He says, I know their works. I, I see what you're doing. Now understand something carefully. We, we are not saved by our works. We've learned that and we understand that. Salvation is the gift of God. We cannot earn it and we cannot work for it and, and, and we sure don't deserve it. The truth of the matter is none of us deserves to have heaven. None of us deserves to be saved. All of us are sinners come short of the glory of God. What we deserve to get is punishment and death and hell uh, and the lake of fire. That's what we deserve. But um, salvation is a free gift of God. Uh, when a person is truly saved, uh, there must be a manifestation of good works. It gives the evidence that you have been saved. Uh, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we know verse 8, verse 9, but let's make sure we don't leave verse 10 uh, out of the equation. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're not saved by our works. We're saved by faith in God's grace and as God's gift. But then verse 10 comes right on the heel and says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so the Bible teaches, notice, created in Christ Jesus. That, that's really a good way to understand that is that in your salvation you've been recreated. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So you are recreated. You're recreated in Christ Jesus. When you have been saved by grace, uh, by, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and through his grace, and you've received the gift of God, you've been, uh, you, you have been uh, now uh, created or recreated in Christ Jesus. And so now it says God's expecting good works to come from us. He's expecting us to have good works. We're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. And Jesus lets uh, the people in Thyatira, uh, though it would have been a, a minority group of them, he lets them know, I, I've seen your works. I understand it. And uh, it's evidence that, that you've been saved. Over in James chapter number uh, 2, I believe James chapter number 2, and you probably uh, remember uh, these verses, James chapter 2, verse 14, 
What doth it profit thy brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what do they profit? Even so faith, if it hath, hath not works, is dead, uh, being alone. And, and down in verse 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Verse 26 in James chapter 2, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now James is not uh, saying that you've got to be saved by your works, but no, he's saying that if your, work, if, if your, if your faith is not producing good works for the glory of God, it's the evidence that you didn't get saved in the first place, you see. It, uh, works is what follows faith. And, I know that, and Jesus says to these, I, I know your works. And so really it's an assurance of their salvation that he's giving to them. Now notice again uh, that he is the omniscient, the all-knowing son of God, when he says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience. And so there's the manifestation of their works. But Jesus, remember, he he. Uh, introduces himself as the Son of God uh, who hath eyes, his eyes like unto a flame of fire. So his eyes are penetrating like, like fire would penetrate. His eyes are penetrating. And so he sees not just the manifestation of their works, but he sees the motives behind their works. Not only seeing their works, but with these eyes of fire. He's able to see the motives behind their works. And he gives the motives here. First of all, he, he said, I know thy works and charity. Charity. And you can, you can interchange and you can use the word love there also. And, and so Jesus says, I see that. I see the motives behind your works. I see your charity. I see your love. And the Lord expects us to be the same way. He expects us to work but he expects us to work with the right motives. And that right motive is the motive of love. And just as he says about himself in John 15, verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did for us. In John chapter 13 and verse 34, you remember how he said to his disciples, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And then he said in the next verse, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And so that charity and that love, that's the motive for their works. And Jesus, with his eyes of fire, he can see that. He saw their charity, he saw their service. The word service means ministry. And ministry is actually love or charity in action uh, that's been put to action. And so he sees that, their charity, their service, and he sees their faith. The word means faithfulness or loyalty. Uh, it means dependability. Uh, in Romans 10 verse 17 it says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know what will really make us to be more dependable uh, for the Lord? is when we really hold to the Word of God. Amen. When we really have the Word of God and we study, uh, Jesus sees this and he saw their patience. Patience is a word for endurance, which means to abide with and to stick with the stuff. And so notice how he said, again, I know thy works, verse 19, I know thy works and, and charity and service and faith and thy patience and so he says, I, I, I see your works and I even see the motives behind your works. They're evidence of your salvation. But, but then he mentions their works again where he says, and thy works and the last to be more than the first. The last to be more than the first. Now this is important because they were motivated. Watch this. They were motivated by charity, by service, by faith, by patience, and because that's the way that they work, and that was their, uh, their motives. Jesus says that their works at the last were even more 
than they were at the first. In other words, they, they, they would increase in their service of the Lord and that they would be doing, they were doing uh, at this point of, the, of receiving this letter that Jesus knew they were doing even more for his glory and more for serving him than they, than they were doing when they first became saved and they first become a part of the church. They were doing more. And so here's the question for us. Uh, how is it with us this evening? Uh, is our works for the Lord more now than they were before? Are we progressing in the Christian life? You see, the Christian life was never meant to be stagnant. It has always been the Lord's expectation that we would grow, that as times go on, we would become more and more faithful to the things of the Lord. Just as the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the wonderful thing is that God has given us what we need for such spiritual growth, such grow, growth in grace and the knowledge of our Savior, uh, such drawing closer and closer to Him the further along we go in the Christian life. He, God has given us all that we need according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, where He says, As newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the Word of God, of the Word, that you may grow thereby. This is how we grow. This is what we grow by. It's by the reading. It's by the studying. It's by the preaching. It's by the understanding. It's by the receiving. It's by the application of the Bible, of the Word of God uh, to our lives. These are some things, these are things that Jesus is commending a, at least a small group of people uh, there in the church in Thyatira. Even though much wickedness was around them, even infiltrating the church itself, there was, there was a remnant that stayed true and, and, and grew in, in spiritual things, grew in grace, grew in the knowledge of their Savior, the Lord Jesus. They grew in their knowledge of the Word and they loved the Word of God and they were growing even more at, at the end of this time than they did at the beginning. Same thing needs to be said about us. And, and so here's the thought. Am I, am I, do I know more now about the Lord than I did when I first got saved? Am I, do I love him more? Am I, walk, am I walking closer to him? Am I, am I serving him better than, than when I began this journey of the Christian life? The truth of the matter is, that's the way it should be for all of us. Sometimes it's not that way uh, for some. Sometimes we go up and down. Sometimes it's like three steps forward and two steps backward but he's given us his word to help us to keep going forward and to keep growing and to keep serving him. And especially in these last days when all the wickedness and all the trouble and all the things is going on around us, even more than ever, we need to uh, take heed to ourselves that we are growing in the things of the Lord and our service uh, and our knowledge and understanding of him and his word. Amen? Amen. We'll go ahead and stand together and we'll pray. Lord, we do thank you so much once again for the word of God. And Lord, we do pray that you'd help us to grow. Help us to grow spiritually, Lord. Help us to grow closer to you. And Lord, we would pray that you'd help our works to grow for you. That we would be doing more for you in, in, in the end than even at the beginning that we would do more. And Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word to help us in those very things. We'll thank you and we'll praise you together. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen.